good afternoon. Thanks very much for coming along. Um, I, did, I did post the invitation a few weeks ago, but it might have messed on it. Over the weeks have passed. I've got a sore throat, so I'm not going to talk too much. Good news. First piece of good news. Um, I appreciate some of you may not have known about this till the last minute. So David will take about 40 minutes. If you're, if you're really under pressure to go for something, he's not going to be insulted if you disappear. Go out the back door, though, I would say, ideally. Um, so this is Dr. David Patrick. You'll be happy with David, I would think, when it comes to questions. From the University of the Free State in South Africa, who's a special interest in media coverage. Oh, well, well, there's several special interests, including the Scottish referendum. That's how we, we met uh, over that particular issue. But this presentation is about Anglo-American press coverage, as you can see, of Bosnia and Rwanda in particular, under the heading of their own type of genocide, the, the, the media coverage. And I think with, with no further ado, I'll just hand over to David at that point. Mm -hmm. Nice, David. Thank you very much, John. OK, uh, one of the things that's actually a bonus for me is I've done versions of this presentation um, in South Africa, and today's going to be the first time that I don't have to adapt my accent and I can actually talk to you on normally, so that's going to be a wee bit of a bonus. Well, I should have told you they're all from Edinburgh. Oh, all right, well, I'll make sure I did anyway. <laughs> um, but what I'll basically be talking about is how, the, how British and American elite newspapers covered the genocides in Bosnia and Rwanda in the early 1990s. Gonna go through it to show uh, basically how it's framed, and one of the main things is that the type of violence is really important. Um, and on the opposite side, the numbers involved aren't really that important. Okay. The second one I'll be coming to is <coughs> the importance of the, the quality of nature, the genocide events, and this is where I'll talk about the refugee crisis that followed the Rwandan genocide, but more specifically the discovery of concentration camps in Bosnia in 1992. And at the end, hopefully for anybody who's <coughs> more interested in history and whatnot, will try to present, this has been the most sort of, uh, I, I wouldn't say controversial, but it's been the most discussed part of the research is trying to argue in the influence of the Holocaust um, over the, the course of the 20th century and how this impacted on Bosnia and Rwanda. Okay, I'll not go over this for too long because you know everyone in here knows what genocide is, etc. But just to give it a bit of sort of theoretical grounding, the word, even though it's as an event as a crime, genocide has probably affected humanity since the first groups of people started uh, coming into contact with each other. They've got examples, um, archaeological examples of this type of violence happening like more than 10,000 years ago. Um, but in the 20th century is where it became, particularly through the media and whatnot, is where people started to um, publicly gain an appreciation of it. And the main examples Armenia, 1915, so that's probably about one and a half million victims. The Holocaust, six million. Uh, Cambodia, probably two, two and a half million. Iraq in 1988, which is uh, several tens of thousands of Kurds. But the two main examples we'll be talking about today are um, Bosnia, or on a wider scale, the, the Balkan conflict that happened in the early 1990s, um, which probably estimates vary, but you're as a rough estimate, you're talking 200,000 civilians were killed in that conflict. Um, and then the Rwandan genocide of 1994, where um, estimates are vary wildly because of the type of violence. But the number that I usually settle on is about 800,000. So that's one of the, the most uh, widely cited. <coughs> um, again, don't need to go over this too much, um, but this is just so that you know the the methodology for this and what I'm actually looking at. Both of the both the, set, the data sets that I'm looking at are based on eight newspapers. <coughs> okay, and that's the, the Times, the Daily Telegraph, the Guardian and the Independent from the UK, and the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune and the Washington Post from the US. So four from each, all of those newspapers as you're probably more than well aware, you know, considered elite, supposed to be a good source of foreign information, so that's why they were picked. The problem in a direct comparison is that the uh, Rwandan example um, lasted about 100 days, so it's only three months, whereas the Bosnian conflict lasted four years, and obviously just purely for, um, you know, the benefit of, like, you know, restraints on time and whatnot. I couldn't look at the, the Bosnian conflict at all. 
So what we had was the data set for Rwanda is the 7th of April to the 29th of July. So that takes in the 100 days of the genocide and an extra two weeks to cover the refugee period, or the, to cover the, the refugee crisis. Um, and that will become a bit more important later on. For Bosnia, what I did was settle on four specific instances of um, major outbreaks and mass violence. So this was 92 and the discovery of the camps at um, like Manjaca or Marska. Um, a very um, bad shelling in Yugoslavia in January 94. Um, the third one, which is probably one of the more important ones, and has been mentioned a lot this year because it's the anniversary, was the massacre at Srebrenica in July 95, where between seven and 8,000 men and boys were killed. Um, and the last one is a, a second shelling uh, in, uh, in Sarajevo, and that's what actually prompted the NATO response. Basically, after going over all that, the main thing you need to remember is both of these data sets are exactly the same size. They're both 114 days, eight newspapers, so any of the statistics that are compared are directly comparable. Right, the first thing, <coughs> first thing to go, which will hopefully lead by way of introduction into like what I'm trying to present here, is the main aspect, again, not hugely controversial point, it's something that people have realised for ages, but the geographical proximity of an event to the West is obviously a key factor in this. So if you look here on, this is <coughs> all four pages, 114 day sample of Bosnia, 3,028 news articles were produced. So um, that doesn't include editorials or letters. So, so this is purely the ones you would get in the news section of it. 3,028 on an exactly comparable scale, time scale, Rwanda only produced 1,233, which is about 2.8. Um, maybe Bosnia got about 2.8 times as much coverage. But where you see the, um, the discrepancy whereby body counts aren't in any way a determinant of how much coverage something will get, is if you think 800,000 people were killed in Rwanda in three months, Okay, uh, whereas in Bosnia, 200,000 people were killed in the space of four years. And it's quite a remedial comparison, but working it out as a sort of uh, monthly or daily death rate, um, it comes to about, the Rwandan genocide was about 48 times swifter and more violent than Bosnia, but as you can see, it got about a third as much coverage. And the main reason for that um, purely as well, the, the, the most uh, most explanatory reason is obviously Bosnia is on the edge of uh, southern Europe, you know, very, very close to Italy, Greece, etc. Um, but it also has historical ties to Russia as well, so it's, it's, it's seen as on Europe's doorstep, it's in our backyard. Whereas uh, Rwanda, the, there's every chance that there'll be and I wouldn't blame anybody for this, there's a good chance that a lot of people in here might not be able to locate Rwanda immediately on a map, right? which was the case for a lot of journalists and a lot of policy makers at the time when this actually occurred. Um, and for anyone who's actually wondering, it's, it's right in Central Africa, it borders the Congo, Burundi, Uganda, stuff like that. But that's just one um, comparison that shows that the scale of the violence and the nature of the violence doesn't mean the press will be interested, it has to be where it is. <coughs> Second one, this one's even more um, uh, illustrative, I think, though, is um, in Bosnia, August 1992, it produced 55 editorials, so I mean like lead articles, the ones that every newspaper has, maybe two or three of them, every day where it talks about well, what they consider the, the most important issues of the day. In only 28 days in August, Bosnia commanded more editorial coverage than Rwanda did over 114. And again, this is a genocide which was um, four times at least as destructive in terms of the loss of human life um, and was probably <coughs> 10 to 12 times as uh, fast in terms of how quickly those people were killed. Um, so, so again, if you look at this, this is just in 28 days, Bosnia could command more um, attention from Western journalists than the Rwandan genocide could from start to finish. <coughs> This year's where we'll go into the similarities though. Okay, and this some of these are quite uh, quite telling when we, we break in there. Whilst there's a big difference comparatively um, in terms of in terms of the quantitative 
um, attention pay, uh, paid to both of these. One of the similarities in both instances is the way that the victims themselves are caricatured or they're marginalised or portrayed as something. Um, for example, this one here, <coughs> all of these returning to its old traditions, region that cannot handle freedom for more than five minutes, full of people who enjoy killing people and don't mind risking their own lives in pursuit of their favourite pastime. These are all from uh, Bosnia. These are all from coverage of Bosnia between 92 and 95. And these are just a couple of examples of literally dozens that could perhaps go into the hundreds. So I've never quantified it, but an underlying theme in the reporting from day one, and it never really goes away, is the assumption that everyone in that region <coughs> is almost equally at fault for what's happening, um, despite the fact that perhaps 90% of war crimes were actually enacted or perpetrated by Serbs. The, the press almost seemed at pains at times to highlight the, the sort of equality of victimhood or equality of guilt even between, uh, between both sides. And to justify this, um, to justify this, some of them will even go back to um, foundational myths of the Balkans that go back to the 14th century and whatnot, and, but bring this into quality journalism, which is supposed to you know, be a bit of a cut above, but they'll say, oh, these people have been doing this since the 14th century. How are they going to change? Give no regard to the very, very varied and sort of bloody history uh, of Bosnia. <coughs> but again, a similar thing, but not looking at this ancient aspect of it, is in Rwanda the same <coughs> the same prism which the violence is, is looked at for those engaged with through is tribalism. And the first problem with this is that the Hutu and Tutsi in Rwanda aren't tribes. Okay, they can be uh, looked at in various ways. It could be socioeconomic groups, it could be a class thing, it could be a caste thing, like in India, but tribes they most certainly aren't. But when it's an unknown country in Central Africa with um, one group of black Africans killing another group of black Africans. This is how the press framed it. And because people know so, so little about the country, most people don't even know where it was, it's much easier to paint that country and its inhabitants as whatever you like. And this fit, fit into um, a very well established and cemented narrative about um, Africa and its as um, inhabitants, which goes back, obviously, you know, to the colonial period uh, and beyond. Again, like the Bosnian example, is even when you get three, four weeks into the, the, the coverage, um, even when you get three, four months, actually, um, this tag of tribalism never goes away, and it's always the explanation. And one aspect, and the tribalism aspect leads to a further use of language, which is quite misleading. Things like, like an orgy of violence, or the unfolding violence appears to be a three-sided tribal war, pitting well armed blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, they're fighting both and being attacked by both. Both of them um, are factually misleading, and that, that wasn't actually what was happening. <coughs> but by describing it as an orgy of violence, or as chaotic, or out of control, it gives the impression that basically an entire country just went mad and started killing each other. And that fit in at the time to established notions of what Africa was. And very, very, very few commentators challenged this, or even in the letters pages. But the problem with it is, is it's, um, it's in, in no way representative of how that genocide was enacted. Is With the exception of the Holocaust, it's probably the most um, expertly planned and executed genocide of the 20th century, okay, you can, uh, the, it seems like a teleological argument, but the easiest way to <coughs> illustrate that is you can't kill 800,000 civilians in three months without without some level of organisation, and that 800,000 in three months I, in itself is misleading because probably 60 or 70 percent of the victims died in the first six weeks, okay, you can't do that if it's not organised. But that's not how the, the British and American press ever covered this. They basically said, you know, this is a load of Africans who have went crazy, and what, what can we do about it? And that narrative was very, very, very really challenged. <coughs> right, you go on to specifically <coughs> Rwanda, and this is about, you know, the, this section that talks about how 
we can look for the evidence that violence, even when it's against civilians, even when it's against women and children, en masse in their thousands, it only becomes a major story or of interest to the uh, to the, the British and American press when um, the, the violence is seen to take a turn which means it's affecting someone else or it's being affected by. So try and, to try and illustrate this, um, when I say evacuation period, this is the, the air, sorry, 7th of April to the 18th of April. So this is immediately after the President's plane was shot down and the genocide was put into force. Again, it was all to plan almost instantaneously. Up until uh, the 18th of April when most uh, of the evacuation had been, you've got 157. After that, you've only got 92. Okay, and obviously a big part of that is white Western journalists left with these same civilians. So this was um, this was going to happen. But as a story in itself, as a story of you know violence on a, a horrific scale that has maybe never been repeated since, um, when the violence was increasing and it was getting actually worse, the the coverage went down. Yeah, so by any um, theoretical construction of how the media engage with violence, that's not how it should be. It's the whole, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. So if the violence, if the violence increases in magnitude, it's expected that the coverage would increase proportionally to cover that, but that's, as you can see, it isn't the case. Another one, which is actually the, the opposite of the same, uh, the same trend, <coughs> in June, uh, mid to late June 1994. Again, this is when the worst of the massacres had, had ended um, and the majority of victims had already been killed. The French uh, government decided to intervene. <coughs> and since then, it's now been shown that they were probably intervening to get uh, members of the perpetrator government out and they were actually helping people um, who were involved in the genocide. But again, at the start of June, the the French going into the country happens on the 15th of June. So again, nothing else happens in the genocide except for the French involvement, but you can see that the coverage of it pops right up. Again, the violence itself, the civilian suffering is not, um, is not an issue here. But because Rwanda is being um, impacted on or being affected by outside actors, outside Western actors, um, it suddenly becomes, suddenly becomes a major news story. Um, and this is the this is the final one. This is quite <coughs> never. This this only came up right at the end of when I was doing the research. It actually became sort of quite a major discovery because I haven't seen it mentioned in many uh, many books. Uh, if you look at your total editorials devoted to Rwanda, so this is all eight sources <coughs> and how many um, editorials they collectively produced in a month. As you can see, there, July is the the most um, productive month, if you want to call it that. Um, I don't have a, a slide for this, but I can read this again to, to highlight this phenomenon, how July 1994 <coughs> was um, provoked a level of press interest that had never been seen up until that point. April 94, there are 249 articles. May, there are 314. June, there are 270. By the time you get to July, it was 400. Okay, so this is proportional, this is a jump of about 35% on the next most productive month. And what the, again, what is it that happens in July that provokes this sudden surge of press interest after the genocide's happened? And it's not, it's not a collective awakening that the British and American press just decided that they actually have to respond to this now. It's because following the victory of the RPF army, um, in mid-July, prompted a massive refugee exodus out of the country, <coughs> like hun hundreds of thousands of people, I mean, comparable to what's happening right now, but on a more localised scale. So possibly two million, maybe more, left the country. But again, that's when the press actually take an interest, and it's not because they've suddenly woken up to the violence, it's because the, 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 uh, the catastrophe or the crisis in Rwanda was now being seen to affect other countries. Okay, it was now being seen to have a, a, a sort of domino effect on the region. So if it can be kept in house, it wouldn't have been as major a story. Had this refugee crisis not happened, Rwanda probably wouldn't even be on in the newspapers come July. 
Okay, so does that does that last? Do those, those three points make sense? Are they all link in the violence, the genocide? Uh, generally, isn't actually that important. It's how it's affecting other people, how it's affecting the wider community, or how it's being affected by them. So very much the, the victims of the genocide are almost passive victims in all this, or passive participants. <coughs> right, um, one more wait for time, Roger. I have no idea. Oh, I can see on my desktop, it's quite passive. Yeah, you've got 20 bucks. <coughs> okay, so from what's been presented so far, it might be quite easy for someone to draw the conclusion, or quite tempting, to draw the conclusion that basically the, the Anglo, you know, the Western powers just simply don't care about genocide and they'll always wipe their hands off it. But that would be a massive oversimplification of this. Is because we especially when we look at this one particular period in the coverage of Bosnia, it was in <clears throat> August nineteen ninety two when the camps, um, the most famous of them, or most infamous I should say, of them being um, Omarska. And these had first been discovered in um, July, but there hadn't been um, TV footage of it. And then Penny Marshall, who was working for ITN at the time, got the first uh, pictures, actual video pictures, of a, a camp at uh, Trinopoli. Um, and almost instantaneously, there's a, a flood of interest from around the world. What is interesting, though, and this is... This is my point of contention is what I would raise is it's not the human suffering that became um, that prompted this interest. It's the fact that it mirrored um, aesthetically the Holocaust. Is because over, as I'll, I'll go on in the last sort of ten minutes to describe the Holocaust has became in the Western world the archetype of what genocide is. It's what you know if you say to most people like genocide, the first thing that will come into their head is images of like, Auschwitz, the Holocaust, and what. <coughs> And you can see that's highlighted in the coverage of Bosnia. Of the four periods um, looked at in this conflict, August 92 has the most coverage by a, quite a considerable distance. Um, even compared to um, July 95, which included the Srebrenica massacre, like I said, the worst massacre that's happened in European soil for a better part of six or seven decades. Um, so if you look just Numerically, in August '92, there was 857 articles produced. In July '95, there was 764. So that's almost a hundred, a hundred of a difference. It was actually quite significant in terms of these, uh, in terms of this this research. <coughs> but again, as you can see here, it's not necessarily that the because these weren't. I should highlight that in Bosnia, these weren't death camps. These weren't the same thing as like Auschwitz or Treblinka and stuff like that. There were um, prison camps, but obviously, <coughs> again, aesthetically, they mirror these images that people are used to from the Holocaust. Of, you, know, these, you know, thin, emaciated, shaven-headed people behind um, barbed wire fences. And this seems to trigger um, a response, both um, quantitatively, in terms of the amount of coverage, but also qualitatively in how um, commentators and um, editors, etc., try to draw attention to this. And it's not necessarily, there's not necessarily because um, several hundred or several thousand people are dying, or, or, that, it's, um, or th that this was the first part in the Bosnian war where civilians were being killed. This has been happening before, but again, because it looks visually like something that we've been um, sort of trained or primed for, over pre previous decades, um, it, it, it echoed. How do I explain this? It echoed the the type of genocide that we've been told to look out for. Okay, you know, camps, uh, camps, barbed wire fences, etc. Rwanda didn't look like the Holocaust. Okay, black people, very low tech, despite its um, level of organisation. You know, machetes, handguns, and stuff like that. And despite the fact that by any indicator that was genocide and should have been publicised as such, it didn't look like the Western image of what genocide is. Okay. And then I just feel that it would bore an uncanny resemblance in manner, if not in scale, to those which disfigured humanity half a century ago. And these are um, these these uh, quotes are just a couple of again, literally like probably hundreds that, that in some way try to draw the images of the camps back to the Holocaust. 
Right, so you go on now, like, why, why would this happen? Why, why do I think this happened? And why is the Holocaust so important in this regard? It's, it didn't happen um, because of one event, or one particular event, it's a cumulative, a cumulative process. Um, and so say if we take, take our starting point, 1945, when the likes of Belson and Buchenwald, etc., were discovered, at that moment there was a huge outpouring of shock and disbelief from British and American outlets. It's, um, one style of journalism which you will no longer see, I don't think any of us will ever see it in our lifetime, um, but it's very common in April and May 1945, is professional journalists, including the likes of um, uh, Richard Dimbleby, like David Dimbleby's father, they are actually at pains in saying explicitly, literally in the text, what I'm saying is true. They actually have to put these disclaimers because the things that were being released were so horrific that they thought it would be on the imagines of most people back home. <coughs> so there was this very, um, very sort of visceral um, reaction to the, the discovery of the camps in '45, but almost immediately that dies away. Okay, so it isn't that there's this a clear, you know, gradual upwards curve of Western exposure to the Holocaust that actually it happens in four uh, distinct stages, and that's what I'll uh, quickly, quickly go over the news and stuff at the time. First one is the, di the release of the Diary of Anne Frank in the 1950s. The the reason that this is important is it was it was very much a product for its time. Was, you couldn't have released you couldn't have released Schindler's List in the 1950s and got away with it or people being shocked by it. But Anne Frank, because again the story is actually you can it can be given to children. It's a very lukewarm introduction to the the suffering and victimisation. That happened that occurred to Jews or was suffered by Jews during the Holocaust, um, and it, it you know does obviously does very very well at ex expressing the, the feelings of someone who's in hiding and has been persecuted. But what it doesn't do is it completely omits any mentions of the camps or any of those sort of details because obviously by definition she couldn't have written them there. Um, so it was it was very much a, as a, a way in. This introduces a generation. A uh, post-war generation into like what happened in the Holocaust, but only at a very, very tepid, very sort of base level. But up until this day, I'd imagine, like myself, I'd imagine a lot of people in here probably read Anne Frank when they were in school. Something that's still being used like decades later. But again, the main thing is it introduced you to the Holocaust, but it didn't really give the sort of gory details, if you want to call it that. These are slowly brought out um, at this the, the trial of Adolf Eichmann, which. Uh, happened in 1961-1962. Caused quite a lot of controversy even before it started because Eichmann, dis despite being the, the most wanted um, Nazi on the planet at the time because he was so integrally linked to the, the sort of organisation organizational application of the Holocaust, um, because he was captured by Israeli agents in Buenos Aires, Immediately there was an international outcry because they said, you know, this isn't legal, blah, 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 blah. But once they went past that, it soon became quite apparent and the young Israeli state was explicit about this. It wasn't, um, they said that this is what they were going to try and do, is they weren't just putting Adolf Eichmann on trial, they were putting Nazism and anti-Semitism throughout history on trial. So this one man in the dock um, became uh, the sort of catalyst for uh, uh, the way it was described by David Ben Gurion was an epic retelling of the Holocaust narrative. So that over the space of like months and months and months and months, um, a lot of the more sort of grotesque and macabre details of the, the Holocaust came out. The gas chambers, you know, the ghettos, the you know, the removal of people's like the removal of people's teeth, you know, all the all the more grotesque aspects of it come out and people started to realise um, what had actually happened and had a bit more um, in-depth knowledge about it. And also, uh, probably the, the best way to explain this is if you think of like the O.J. Simpson trial, or um, some folk are probably too young for that, maybe better ones, the Oscar Pistorius trial, the, the moment big, um, uh, big media event, this is the first time this happens. This is the first major um, media legal proceedings. Um, 
on the first day, for example, on the first day out of the 700, 750 seats in the courtroom, 450 of them were taken by journalists, which gives like, a good indication of the level of interest in this. Um, and then eventually, Eichmann was found guilty and was hanged, and his, his execution, again, prompted a lot of, uh, prompted a lot of controversy. <coughs> But how this ties in, and I'll make it soon, so hopefully this flow makes sense. If Anne Frank introduces the, the notion of Jewish suffering into the Western consciousness, then the Eichmann trial provides some of the exact details and raises the bar somewhat in terms of highlighting that level of suffering and what happened. Right, third one, um, not, this was uh, released in 1978. I wouldn't be surprised if very few people in here have seen it because it's not a. It's um, it was again it was a product for its time. When you watch it now, very dated. Um, some of the the script uh, isn't isn't as tight as it as it could be. But what they do by bringing the likes of say James Woods, Meryl Streep, young but you know uh, quite important, well-known actors at the time, um, the Holocaust was a dramatization about a family called the, um, the Weiss family uh, from Berlin, uh, a Jewish family, and basically how, they, how, how the, the Holocaust affects them from 1933 right up to 1945. It's about, it's about 10 hours long, and, uh, and it, but it does cover almost every major aspect of the Holocaust, like the massacre at Baba Yar, the gas chambers at Auschwitz, Kristallnacht, all these things, the enabling act all these um, sort of things, and it, you can actually see how it was uh, influenced by um, Eichmann uh, pr um, 15 years previously, because up until, right up until really this came out, even with the aspect of um, Adolf Eichmann, he helped change this, is the stereotypical notion of a Nazi perpetrator, a Nazi killer, was a, basically a psychopath, like someone who enjoyed doing it, was just a, a sadistic person. What Eichmann and later Holocaust showed was more the idea of a desk killer. Um, what um, Hannah Arendt spoke about, about what the banality of evil. I mean, ultimately, if we look at, say, like Eichmann, Eichmann himself probably never killed anyone, probably never even hit anyone, etc. But his signature probably led to the deaths of two million people. But again, the reason this is important in a uh, a sort of a British and American appreciation of the Holocaust and understanding of it, it this dramatised it. Okay, and obviously, you know, drama it brings brings people in. You can empathise with the characters in a certain sort of way, and it was quite good at illustrating some of the the things that happened. What, um, but what was unique about this was the amount of educational publicity that went along with it. School in the week it was released. Um, schools, etc., were given uh, education packs. People went around schools giving talks, like survivors, etc. Um, and it was also did very, very well um, critically. But the, the key part for this idea of a Western understanding and appreciation of the Holocaust, and this is in 1978, is by, by the most conservative estimates, at least 100 million Americans watched this. So at the time you're talking, that's probably just under, uh, just around about 50% of the population. So a massive, massive TV event and something which again um, generated an, an awful lot of um, a sort of renewed interest in the Holocaust and this leads into, because in, and that probably led into the fact in the 1980s it starts being mandated in schools and whatnot. And then the peak one, again, I imagine quite a lot of people in here have seen this. But the peak of this comes in 1993, coincidentally, while the Bosnian War is happening and a few months before Rwanda happens. Um, Schindler's List was released in 1993, an American production but a mostly British cast. Okay, so uh, a big impact on both sides of the um, both sides of the Atlantic. It's currently um, on the Internet Movie Database, which is the biggest movie website on the internet. It's currently ranked the sixth best movie ever made, so very influential and very um, critically acclaimed. But again, more so, I, I've been looking, I can't find, uh, I've been sorry, someone in here might know some, it's very difficult to ever find um, British and American leaders um, publicly endorsing a movie. 
Okay, this happened with Schindler's List. Like Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton said it was an American duty to go out and see this film. Um, the um, probably someone you could even might be even slightly more uh, influential than Bill Clinton is Oprah Winfrey. And at the time, Oprah Winfrey um, did the same. She went on a show and said seeing this film had made her a better person. And again, breaks any sort of records for uh, viewing figures for a, a Holocaust-related movie. Um, I think it won seven, seven Oscars, I think, in the 1994 awards. Again, becomes a, a sort of a cultural, uh, cultural bench point in terms of the. And again, this becomes the the high point of when the uh, when the Holocaust is is almost integral or is, or is best known. This is the high point for Western knowledge of the Holocaust. Okay, so so far is this little bit making sense? Like why each of these are why why each of these are important? Basically, what I'm trying to argue is by the early 1990s there was a peak of Holocaust awareness in the West, and with these things, it always says you know we have a um, a rhetorical uh, tendency to every time something like this happens, you'll see it with Syria, you see it anytime as a we should respond to this. The, the West, you know, with its liberal democratic values and its commitment to human rights, should respond to this, but it's proven to be no more than rhetoric. It never happens. And even at this point in 1993, right in the midst of Bosnia and Rwanda, Rwanda should have given uh, Western policymakers and at least Western journalists some reason to actually act on their, you know, high, fine-sounding words. But as you know, highlighted at the start, that that wasn't the case. And how sort of tie this in um, with the bit at the end? Um, I might have actually timed this in a minute, John. If you please. The this uh, from William Shockers only when something can be compared, perhaps rightly, perhaps wrongly, but always plausibly, with the Holocaust will assume truly disastrous proportions in our perceptions. And there's um, quite a lot of evidence to, su to actually support that. And um, like I said, there's the, the the point in the the early section where August 1992, the discovery of the camps, was by far. Uh, generated by far the most coverage, but it wasn't the most destructive in terms of loss of human life or its effect on the outside region. But visually, it looked like this event, which over the previous 50 years, um, people had become familiarised with and basically been told was the archetype of what genocide is. And the reason that this has uh, certainly got some implications for the future, or even for the, you know, the very day we're speaking, is um, you only need to uh, I'll go back to that. You only need to look at the sort of um, crisis in Syria, which we've been on for years now, but it only actually becomes page one news once migrants start flowing out of that country. Once it starts affecting the wider region, you would have slight blips when massive outburst of um, Islamic State violence or Assad uses chemical weapons. But on the whole, the suffering of civilians is not seen as important enough to want front page coverage. And this will be something, once you're tuned in, you see it, you see it all the time. And Syria is a very, very good example of this at the moment. Um, this is not to say, though, that there is absolutely no interest in genocide whatsoever. I mean, 2015 is quite a, an important year in this regard. It's the 70th anniversary of uh, it's the 70th anniversary of the liberation of um, Auschwitz. It's also the 20th anniversary of Srebrenica. Um, but the one I find slightly more interesting is the 100th anniversary of the Armenian genocide. And as a final point, this will hopefully tie in how, despite the fact rhetorically we are told that genocide is really important, it's a, a crime that shocks all of humanity, and we have a, almost an innate moral human response to respond to it, it's, that, that's not actually what happens. Um, the reason I know it's quite a strange thing that like the last slide's got a picture of Kim Kardashian on it, but Kim Kardashian and System of a Down um, are, are two of the most um, prominent and hard-working groups for trying, or, or individuals, for trying to highlight the Armenian genocide because to this day Turkey deny it ever it ever happened. And uh, to show how this isn't based on moralism, it's actually based on 
um, realpolitik considerations most of the time. As about three years ago, the United States tried to pass a resolution officially recognizing the Armenian Genocide, <coughs> and the Turkish government said, well, you can do that, but you can no longer land your planes in Turkey. And funnily enough, the bill disappears like that. Okay. And I suppose that I always, I've, I, every time I do these sort of presentations, I always want to try and end on some sort of like happy note or something that's not horrifically cynical. But it's quite difficult. It's quite difficult to do. And what I'd argue about, look forward to discussing this with everybody here, is if we look at the responses to genocide in the 1990s in two cases that were unarguably or unquestionably genocide. When we look at the lack of interest generally in the victims and specifically this marginalisation of the victims in the face of overwhelming evidence of mass war crimes and genocide, the fact that the British and American press can ignore that or misconstrue it and distort it to such a degree doesn't really fill us with any great hope for the future and by any number of models genocide is going to become more prevalent in the 21st century so the things that I've highlighted today are probably going to be repeated again, unfortunately. But thanks for listening. Thanks very much for that. <laughs> A devastating finish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I found the whole thing uh, fascinating. So very quickly, I'll have time to ask questions. Does anyone want to ask a question or make a comment? I think they're mad. Yeah, David, you, you said at the start of the presentation that you said it was it's something that has been going on since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, um, is there a parallel with, as you were talking about, the repetition of the aesthetic or the aesthetic condition of the law course? Mm -hmm. There's a thing. It's really subtly and clearly demonstrated in the presentation. Um, are there, to your knowledge, any historical Ah, that's a that's a very interesting point. So, do you mean the aesthetic of violence, or? Uh, well, when I say, I mean, I think you can refer specifically to the visual aesthetic. It mm -hmm. was an example of, you know, that the, the was used a lot in the Western, the Western press and the Western media. Um, I'm just wondering, obviously. It's it's a it's a difficult one because the, the term as a brilliant that's one of the best questions I've actually been asked for, well they like name ignore it, is the best way I could sort of describe it is that genocide um, as a concept, the word itself was only put into print in 1944. So, and it becomes a crime under international law, or it becomes recognised under the UN Convention on the uh, Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in 1948. So, um, you're looking at this same period as actually already almost pre mass media and how we understand it. So, this building up of an aesthetic could only really happen with. The Holocaust. Does that make sense? In terms of, to my mind, in terms of the timing of the Holocaust, that's why it was allowed to build up this aesthetic. Because at first it goes through literature, then it goes through, and um, the Eichmann trial was predominantly through TV, then it's through drama, then it's through cinema. And um, there hasn't really been a, an online sort of version of this. Um, but ultimately, the way that um, the reason I mentioned like the, the use and invention of the term genocide in 1944 it was because of that timing and because the the shock and disbelief which poured out very briefly but very and quite to quite a, a degree in April and May 45 the the term genocide because of when it was invented and because these images were in people's heads has always been inter, interlinked with the Holocaust that makes sense like they've always been bedfellows purely because of the historical timing of when they happened. Like if the genocide, if the Holocaust had happened in 1900, but uh, the Genocide Convention had only been created in 1950, there wouldn't be this intrinsic link. But 
to this day, I mean, almost a few, uh, like Holocaust Memorial Day on the 27th of January, <clears throat> for a while they tried to make that Holocaust and Genocide Memorial Day, but um, in recent years the and Genocide bit has just been taken away, and again that reinforces even up to this day that the image that people get of Genocide and what Genocide is, is the Holocaust, it's camps, barbed wire, it's it's organised on that scale, but legally speaking, um, legally speaking and practically speaking, you don't have to kill six million people in camps for it to be genocide. But that's what people, um, the sort of layman, understands genocide as, and it means that you can actually, by comparison, nothing compares to it. Even eight hundred thousand people being killed in Rwanda, it's eight hundred thousand people being killed. But you match that up to six million, it's not in the same league. And it does so. Sorry, does that ramble a bit there? But does that answer your question at least in terms of the timing? Thank you. Can I come into that one just very briefly? I mean, in, in the 19th century, there were various genocidal events with regard to North American Indians, the, the, the Aborigines in Australia, the Tasmanians. You know, the, 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 the genocide in Tasmania was 100%. All Tasmanians were killed, every single one. None survived. I've, I have now a principal, of course, is from Tasmania. I haven't mentioned that to him. Yeah, I haven't complimented them on the world's best genocide. But the thing is that all of those genocides were largely embraced as good things by the majority of the population. They were seen to be a Darwinian replacement of the weak by the strong. That's the way nature is. So there were, there was, there were, there were no doubt there were people uh, anxious about all of that in the 19th century, but it's really, it's very much a modern thing. Mm. And I think, I think anxiety about genocidal behaviour is, is really very quite recent. Yeah. Aye. Can I could just maybe add something to that? Because we had a discussion earlier on, which uh, might feed into this. I think for, for a lot of, whether it's crimes or political events, when it comes to the media, there's there's often a sort of seminal event which becomes almost like you say earlier the sort of benchmark. And you know, when it comes to genocide, the first one that always springs into anyone's mind is the Holocaust, of course, and various other genocides that unless you've got a personal tie to them, the first one you always spring to spring to mind is that because we talked earlier on a little bit about um, not so much the pros and cons, but we talked about the issue of dictatorship, for example. And whenever anyone hears the term dictator, automatically what will spring to mind is likely to be probably one of the three people, either Hitler or Gaddafi or who else was it mentioned earlier on? Saddam. Yeah, or Saddam. Say that's usually what would spring to mind for somebody. And everyone always thinks, for example, about dictatorship being a massively negative thing, I despite mean, the fact that there's been hundreds, if not thousands, of known dictators um, over centuries both malevolent and benevolent. Um, but it's always there's always some sort of seminal moment that the media and the entertainment industry seems to sort of latch on to, which then becomes that sort of known quantity, if you like. I think the idea when you when you mention like archetypes, yeah. that's certainly the case. I mean you could make the same argument maybe for say what the Kennedy assassination is to <laughs> political assassinations or what nine eleven is to terrorism. You know, that's seen as like, you know, it has that intrinsic link to the world. I just wonder because the question which I, which I was going to actually ask was related to this, this idea of um, the, the similarities being drawn between the Holocaust and then subsequent genocides. Do, do you think that it's a, um, either a conscious or subconscious thing? Because even in the Rwandan genocide, genocide against the Tutsi, there, was, there were still some events which could have drawn parallels with um, with the Holocaust, um, Murambi, which you'll no doubt know about, Murambi was a, a technical college in Rwanda, which was um, in the process nearly completed and ready for opening in 1994. And just just as you said, when the the, the, the genocide commenced, it was so well organised that within hours of the present Harvey Amanda's plane being shot down in Rwanda roadblocks strategically were placed all around the country. So that there was checkpoints, if you were a Tutsi, you were quite often killed in the spot or tortured or something. But the point was that in, in one particular region within Rwanda with this technical college in Rambri, and approximately 50,000 Tutsi were taken to that technical college and held there for two weeks with no food, no water, no electricity. If any of them tried to leave, there were roadblocks all around it, they were shot. Now strategically that position of Rambri was very important because it was surrounded by hills. So the, 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 the Hutu militia at that time could monitor what was going on. And these people were effectively kept in a concentration camp-like situation 
for uh, for it wasn't for a, you know, for length of time and stuff. It wasn't for a long period of time. But it was two to three weeks before then the Hootsie militia came in and massacred all fifty thousand bar seven. There were seven survivors out of the fifty thousand that were killed there. And the the imagery from that particular place, you could draw parallels with some of the imagery from although of course the, the fact that you've got the black white today, but the, the imagery from what went on there could be drawn. But yet the Western media never seemed to look to that specific example. It's, uh, I think what you just you touched on right at the end is that the big the big divide, the big contrast between it is the black and white mm. thing and also because the nature of the Rwandan genocide fed into these um, it's all like you know, well-established notions of the savagery and primitivism of, of Africa. Um, but another interesting aspect—I never actually mentioned it there—it's also the fact that it's, a, it's that the Holocaust has become the archetypal, you know, specific type of like a standard bearer for what people conceive of genocide. It's actually a specific part of the Holocaust, which has become emblematic of the Holocaust, as much in the same way as. Uh, you know, several hundred thousand people in Rwanda were herded together and shot in the head. That's not how people think of the Holocaust. They think of it as camps. They, that's what became iconic about it. So it's, it's quite interesting that it's, that it's not even just the Holocaust. It's a specific type of, of imagery that we've been um, sort yeah, of sensitised to. The students are actually quite a young group. And I'm wondering if, they, in some ways, Rwanda and the Bosnia are quite historical for, for most of you. Some of you not born. In 1992, um, is there anything in, in more recent history, th things you've been observing in the last decade or so, that, that make you think of these same ideas, something similar? I think Palestine is one of the recent examples. There, be, there is not a lot of coverage regarding what is happening within the Palestine or the, within the Gaza Strip. We we heard and we watch what all the rest, the media, media, Israeli media, Israeli government gives us the information. We don't have the access, the core hardcore information. Rather, we are getting the videos that I've been putting on social media, but they, that's not authentic source as well at the same time. I think that's, I think that's a, a perfect example. I mean, whilst obviously the situation in Palestine wouldn't be described as genocidal, there's, you know, as you know, it's a massive human rights violations going on by the Israeli government. They're constantly, but the, the version we're getting is completely Completely I different. I think you could debate the extent to which it is genocidal in some ways. Um, I agree it's not the same as the Holocaust, but, but there are aspects of, of it which are quite like the genocidal behaviour to, to go towards the American Indian tribes and so on. Ideology. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. I mean, is the genocide just to killing the people or just to make people <coughs> so hard that they, they feel themselves more harder to be alive than being there? And in, in some ways, the, the, the Palestinian example that's been raised is, whilst the violence isn't on the same scale, it's actually a, an even more extreme version of what I was trying to talk about then. Because in Bosnia and Rwanda, you didn't really have a, a notion of, you know, being, that's very simplistic, but like good guys and bad guys. It was this notion that they're all equally guilty, they're all equally violent, and this is ancient, it's almost hereditary in their genes. But in the, the Israeli-Palestine, instance, the way at least it's portrayed in Western media is that there is specifically a good or a bad guy, which is an even bigger distortion than what I'm talking about here. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think what's happening in Palestine is unavoidably on a smaller scale because there are less people. And although it's a big population of all, the, the, there's much of it, I think, that's, that could be considered similar. Certainly, if we call if we call what happened in North America genocidal, mm. some people would argue that they, they the clearances in Ireland and in some, to some extent a degree of, ge of genocidal quality. To them, then I think what's happening in Pakistan is relatively, basically, is by no means completely different from that. I think so. I think you could you could uh, you could make a case from people having the past. I mean, you just need to look at the conditions in, in Gaza. I mean, and it's essentially one huge camp. And when when Hussein when Saddam Hussein was oppressing the the Kurds, Western commentators described that as genocidal. But then again, when we arrive and start oppressing the same people, suddenly it's not genocidal. Well, you won't find it. I mean, I just, sorry, I mean, I'm aware of the students who have turned up here. Great question, and do you want to get in? Yeah, I'm wondering, um, would you describe what the West has done? As, what you said then, would you describe that as genocide? Uh, well, in what well, instance, mean, like in Iraq and Afghanistan and whatnot? Or I mean, with like drone strikes and stuff, I mean, it's I, not really. I mean, you can say. Well, well you obviously. They, they can say that oh, it's, a, it's a specific target in mind, but um, how often 
the, I mean, the hospital in Afghanistan, you said, would you say that that's quite I would nice? Does that mean more? Personally, I mean, from my sort of like, the, the um, so the, the conceptualization or understanding I have of genocide is so I always have the same starting point as I always take the legal basis of it, which it is riddled with holes. Um, uh, but the, the the drone strikes example um, you bring up, they wouldn't be counted as genocide because there isn't the intent to wipe out an entire, well, a, a sizable part of the population. What is the legal? Uh, sort of term, uh, sort of the explanation for genocide, because obviously we know, I, I know it's sort of a general term, but I mean, I mean what, what would you say constitutes a genocide? And what it's because, in fact, we were, we, were met, we were talking about this at lunch, just before we came in, and one of the big, big problems with the, the genocide convention ratified by most countries in 48, so you're talking it's nearly, you know, nearly seven years old, is one of the, the big problems for me is First of all, who is defined as potential victims? Because it's not just anyone, it's um, religious, racial, ethnic, or national. Right? One group which is quite um, explicitly removed from that is political groups. So if you, can, if you kill everyone in a city because they're communist, that's not legally, that isn't genocide. But at the same time, gender isn't covered. If you kill everyone because they're, they're female, that's not genocide. And again, because gender state. Gender state, again, but that's, well, that's what they call it, but again, that's not a, a legally yeah. defined term. So they can, it's, yeah. and the, the problem with it. Yeah, there's been an, an historical period since the definition of the word. And the word is the murder of a people. Genocide, like homicide, the murder of a person. Genocide, the murder of a people. So there has to be at least the intention to wipe that whole people from the situation. So you could but again, you say in whole or in part, and it's a, yeah. the, the drone strikes examples, like a, a really, a really uh, good example, but I would describe the, the drone program as more, um, that would be, to my mind, as war, uh, war crimes, yeah. not um, not genocide, because it, it's not part of, a, like you said, a wider plan to take out like, an, an entire group. And that's how, that's again why the numbers aren't necessarily important, because you're, you're talking, despite the fact that they try to deny it, or try to minimise it, I mean, you could have had, since 2003, it's got to be upwards of 500,000 civilians have died in Iraq as a, a result of the destabilisation and the invasion of that country. But that 500,000, even if they're all Iraqis, doesn't matter because it's not part, legally doesn't matter because it's not part of a, an overall, seen as a part of an overall um, process of doing this. But you only need to look at the Rwandan example. The, the uh, evidence that genocide is happening can be blinding, and, but if the West aren't involved, they can ignore <coughs> it anyway. And, and yet all the people of Rwanda are actually genetically very close. Mm. So the idea of the one genetic group is trying to wipe out another is not true. It, it was a subcultural thing rather, wasn't it? Uh, but again, that's why the, like, the word, you know, the use of tribes was really misleading. Yeah, like, But that, again, feeds into this whole aspect. Things, things are all in tribes. Group, uh, there was only one people, so you, you kind of really murder yourselves. In mm. the well, that's, that, was, that was the excuse that the US used you know, uh, when the uh, genocide in Cambodia was unfolding. Because it was seen as Cambodians killing Cambodians, so yeah. they say, oh, it's not genocide. But, so, but some people use the word genocidal, don't they? Mm. Or they can use auto genocide, genocide or sweet genocide. genocidal and whatnot. There's something like that with the French when they were going through the revolution in the Girons. Like, yeah. anyway, I'm sure there was like a huge butcher of people down there, and they were trying to get to class as a genocide, and they were told, well, it was French, modern French. Was it a, a, this, was this a, a, a local population? I think so, uh, yeah, it was it was a lot. They were the as well. I think it was near like kind of border region. Because there were massacres of Protestants in yeah. class. But that was before the revolution. Oh, okay. See, when the Americans dropped atom, uh, atom bomb in 1945 mm. on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, was that a genocide or not? So, I, but I wasn't, I wasn't smiling there at like, the notion of atomic devastation. It was because I, I, when they started when I was asked, I knew, I knew that question was coming. It's a really hard one to answer. It's, I would, it's one of those things I would put. <coughs> it's, well, there's three ways to say it wasn't genocide. There's one at the time it wasn't legally defined as that. There isn't. Um, there has to be the in, uh, explicit intention to try and wipe out a sizable po uh, partial uh, uh, po uh, proportion of them. But when you say that, it's a very, very interesting because you're talking that what Nagasaki is 70, 70,000 people killed instantly, yeah. right? Something like that. Um, but because it wasn't. Legally speaking, legally speaking, it wouldn't be seen as genocide. But again, 
uh, even though it's not looked at in this way, I would clearly define that as a walk in. It's a problem because we've come to think that genocide is the worst word, and so everybody wants to have genocide applied to their. Well, was was that? their you know, I think there, there's a quite simple way to actually think, well, not simple, but there's, there is a way to, to sort of clarify, I think, the notion of that it can't be genocide. You know, that under the, the sort of link and definition of genocide, like you say, and talking about what comes legal in terms of, you've got to be targeting a specific group because they are a member of that specific group or because they're associated with that specific group. So um, in Rwanda, for example, the target group was the Tutsi. There were Hutus that were killed. But they weren't killed because they were Hutu, they were killed because in some way they were associated with that Tutsi group. So you may have had political sympathisers or people who were moderate or people who simply didn't, didn't support the genocidal regime at the time. Their deaths would still be classed as genocide, but they weren't, they weren't killed because they were Hutu or Twa or some other ethnicity, they were killed because of their association with that group. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're talking about World War II, the atomic bombings, people weren't killed because of the nationality, they were killed because it was a wartime situation. You know, the, the intention wasn't because of the ethnicity. No, no. This is the thing. And th there would have to be a, a strong link of the reason for the killing being linked to because they were from that yeah. race group, for example. If the killing was for another reason, it's then what was classed yeah. as a warning. But the problem quite often comes with the blurring of the boundaries when it comes to the judicial process that follows yeah. these events. So, for example, you've got the, the, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda that was set up by the UN. You've also got the one that was set up for the Yugoslavia as well. But within these trials, what they don't do is, although they were set up on the basis of a genocide, they try crimes which were both genocide and war crimes. So you could have somebody being tried for war crimes, but the the misinterpretation and by the press coverage and the media coverage sometimes is that they were tried because of genocide. Whereas in reality, it may not be, it may be war crimes. So the, 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 the boundaries between what is genocide and what is war crimes is quite often blurred um, through the, the structures that are set up and then through like you're saying, the media so they don't understand these issues. It can also be a tactical thing. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Because by, especially, I mean, in the uh, Rwanda, they, they never, you know, after the UN left, uh, they never had any intention of going. The, the French went in unilaterally. You know, but if you look at like um, Bosnia, um, in the period that I was looking at in like '94 and early '95, um, I c could be jumping to conclusions here, but this um, deliberate means of trying to equate all groups. So they tried to say, you know, the Croats are just as bad as the Muslims, and Muslims are just as bad as the Serbs, which wasn't true. But if you can present and build up and reinforce the idea that there's no point intervening in a region, because they do this every five years, they do this every ten years, even when it's not true, it discourages intervention. It's another reason why in Rwanda they, they kept using the terms like ancient or ancestral, even though there's no evidence of any conflict between Hutu and Tutsi before like colonisation, um, before the, the Belgians and the Germans and whatnot took over, um, if they can present this this facade, that oh, this is it's almost in these people's DNA, they're like cats and dogs, they'll always fight. Then there's not going to be that groundswell of um, public demands for intervention because it's seen as a wasted effort. Does that make sense for us? Well, I, like, I think that's quite an important point. I think there's an example of, I mean, you've been in South Africa, so you'll probably, so mm -hmm. be, I don't know if you've known about it. You've got the parallels of the British putting Afrikaners in concentration camps, mm -hmm. which, is that not the first time concentrate, concentration camp was there? There and like, uh, the Spanish in Cuba as well. So there are that, but then also with the tribalism aspect, the Zulus, who are quite a fierce nation, mm -hmm. they beat the British, they beat the Dutch, whatever, they went up and down the coast of East, of Eastern and South Africa, and just cleaned out the causes. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that because they they were a strong army, whereas everyone else was sort of just farmers and very passive. They they just incorporated. That's how they built that nation by just taking over every also just like raiding the, <coughs> the mountain side there from from north from Natal all the way down to Port Elizabeth. Interestingly, though, is like the, I mean, from the time I've been in South Africa, I've, I've never really heard that aspect ever sort of mentioned historically. Which oh, like, I'm not, do you know what I mean? It's like it's interesting that that narrative's there, but it isn't used more than like in like Zulu or closer dialogue. Like that, that would be. But the the example you gave with the um, like the concentration camps that the British 
operated in South Africa. Again, it's how selective this history can be. I mean, in 1945, like I said, you know, you've got British, uh, British journalists saying how horrific the likes of Belson and Dachau and that were, that, you know, it was almost beyond description and people wouldn't believe it. But there's not a single one, there's not a single one of those news reports that says, that links the existence of concentration camps to it being a British invention. Like not one. It's never mentioned on Holocaust Memorial Day. It's never, you know, it's just a, uh, a sort of like unfortunate uh, or inconvenient part of our history. And that doesn't fit in with this narrative. But as, as John mentioned, I mean, every every European empire has a, was built on a history of genocide. But that's it's just a, an aspect that's just been sort of pushed to one side. Uh, now, even in the US, they don't, they, they don't admit that that was genocide. I mean, talking maybe 95% of the population was wiped out. Um, uh, you said that you think <coughs> the 21st century genocide would be more prominent or just as prominent. And um, also, John said uh, that um, the perception of it, um, you know, and you also said that, uh, for example, America and Britain and uh, their genocide was largely perceived as a good thing. So, in the 21st century, do you, and firstly, what makes you think there will be more? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think the perception will be uh, always, uh, as it is at the moment, um, a negative thing? And also, um, what will constitute, uh, for lack of a better phrase, good genocide and bad genocide in the eyes of the, uh, the Anglo American media? I would say probably in the way, it's, it's a really good question, man, is um, what, I would, what I would go with is I think it will be, there will never be something which is ever described as a good genocide from now on, but what you will have is there are bad genocides and there are genocides which we are completely indifferent to, and probably 80% of them are going to be the latter. If it doesn't impact on Western interests, then there is no, despite the, the, mor- the moral factor of it, morality doesn't guide foreign policy or, or even guide um, press interest. So that that won't happen, whereas the likelihood of bad genocide, genocides are bad when they're perpetrated by a regime that doesn't play ball with us. I mean, a very good example is if you look at the um, US sort of CIA-backed client states in South America, and uh, like right from the, the 60s up to the 1980s, a lot of them were being funded by the US government and were embarking on genocidal programs and programs of ethnic cleansing. But because in the expression that the CIA always used was he might be a he might be a son of a bitch, but at least he's our son of a bitch. It's basically if you're on side with us, you can do what you want. Saddam Hussein got away with um, persecuting the Kurds for years because at that point he was a an American ally. But then if you look at the coverage um, of pre-invasion 2003 and pre-1991. As well, Hitler is suddenly the biggest threat. Uh, help, sorry, um, Saddam Hussein is suddenly presented as Hitler, and he's the biggest threat to, to global stability. And he's been committing genocide for years. When he was doing it as a client, no one cared. But uh, so to answer the, f- the second part of the question, it's not what happens in the genocide; it's where it happens and who's doing it. That's what's important to the West. The reason, and again, not to sound enormously cynical or pessimistic, but for me, there's two factors that are going to mean that genocide in this century is going to be worse. One is overpopulation, okay? Because uh, the more the more people the more people are in certain regions, especially when you start putting economic pressure on groups, in almost every instance of mass violence and organised genocide, when basically when you make people poorer, they become more extreme in their views and they become uh, less resistant to extremism. Okay, and you can see this, um, and you can see this, you know, almost every day in the news. Um, but the other aspect of that is, is I think climate change is going to be the biggest factor in terms of prompting genocide, because this could be the first century in history where we have people fighting over war, and not just on a, and that can be on a local scale, it can be on a national scale as well. And the other aspect which ties into the overpopulation thing is, there's going to be with rising sea levels and um, other economic factors, there's going to be less land for people to live on. And you're also going to see, I mean, they, they think by 2050, like, massive parts of Bangladesh are going to be under water. So if that happens, where are those millions of people going to go? They're going to go into India, they're going to go into Pakistan. That's going to lead to, to, to conflict. 
and that's going to that can be repeated all over the world. And I think that the the economic argument of it is a, is the, the key one. Is when people when people get desperate when they can't you know feed their families or when they can't have access to fresh water. All you need when you get that desperate, if you've got a, a regime that says, well, there's enough water for us, but there's not enough water for them. What's the solution? You get rid of them. People, you know, it sounds like a zero sum game, and that people won't go for that. But there's countless examples in history where that's how easy it is. When people are desperate, they'll, they'll listen to, to um, extreme ideas. Didn't that happen last year in South Africa? With there was a little genocide going on within the townships of oh, yeah. the economic yeah. migrants from Zimbabwe. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect example, actually. Yeah. Anyone who was in South Africa, they were getting lynched. Uh, no, that's like a, the media that's coverage here was like page twenty-five. But like you said, it's got nothing to do with yeah, America. So, and again, like that purely comes down there. You know, there's a, a slight slump in the economy. People lose their jobs, and then you always want someone to, you know, you always want a scapegoat. And it's very easy, like you know, you say in the townships, or you know, it's these Somalis that have come in, it's these Zimbabweans that have come in, and you see that, and that's only on a very small scale. You know, but when you take in um, propaganda and state and bureaucratic apparatus and, and, a, and a military. You can do it very, very easily, and it doesn't take a lot for the, the people to jump on board. You actually just started answering the question I was going to ask the other day, because one of the things that hasn't really been touched on so far is the, the origins of this, of, of a number of these genocides. So if you're talking about genocides that you think may happen in the future, do you foresee that most of them will be originating from the people, from the citizens of countries, or do you see anything as being state it can be, it can be mani- I, predominantly I can see them being manipulated by the state because the state is the one that's got the infrastructure and the capabilities to do this on mass. I mean, whilst you know you can have small outbursts of violence and hatred, you know, like you just said, like in the townships yeah. in South Africa, to do this on a national scale, you need a national I infrastructure. Think the reason I'm asking from a media perspective is that it's a really interesting thing to run out. I think that. For, for us in Scotland, I think that actually Independence Day was really the first time that we've seen this sort of search of real interest in politics amongst especially young people, and a lot of that was done through social media. And the fact that people then, well, you know, can actually group together in large numbers much more easily now through things like social media than they could in the past, whereby you would rely on state cohesion and state direction to get involved in these things. A lot of the time that's not the case, and a lot of the time people will, will have similar ideals and they can grow those numbers without the need to be directed by the state. Well, 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 Scotland's oil, yeah, yeah. most of the world. Yeah, 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 but this, this is the thing, so it's, uh, to me again, it seems like it's a, it's a personally, I think. Well, that's sort of the groundswell of hatred yeah. and, and, and intolerance. I mean, you only need to look at sort of the likes of something like Britain First on Facebook. Yeah. You know, it's constantly like anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant, and you know, wildly exaggerated stories and whatnot. But that's that's got something like 1.5 million subscribers. You know, that's already a community there that have yeah. got that sort of that sort of um, like interest and belief, and it's you know, it's quite kind of very interesting. The when you mention social media, the thing I would be more interested about is if a genocide on the scale of Rwanda occurred now. Would it generate more interest because now we've got the technology to film it as it was happening? Yeah. Like and and like you know if someone in the uh, um, the commune that you're talking about, if, if someone could have been filming that, yeah, that that's that on that's Twitter, what, would that make a difference? That's actually what I was going to say when you were talking about the figures about reporting and how they went down rather than up mm. when the killing was at its worst. I was going to ask the question: Do you think part of that is because? You know, because at that point, all those presented as chaotic, very literally, very literally, it was chaotic at that point. And to actually have um, accurate reflections of what was going on for state, for them, for, for the media to actually get access to these things would have been nigh impossible. So, for, I, I, don't, I don't know if, it, if, if it's a question of maybe if the media weren't reporting because they weren't able to get the information so readily or easily as when there was still some. That's just the infrastructure press factor. Um, that's that's definitely. I mean, I know that a lot of uh, who's it, Mark Mark Doyle, yeah. who worked at the BBC. I mean, he he had to wait until he could get access to the UN satellite phone till he could contact London. And if you've got, you know, if numerous uh, journalists have got that same hindrance, yeah. or those same factors hampering them, it could be. And be a, I mean, you do see, and if you, that never very rarely gets highlighted. Um, 
But if you, you know, if you watch the news, if you watch the news now, generally in one half a news bulletin, there's at least one clip that's been clearly taken off somebody's mobile phone. And if that had been in, like, if yeah. that had happened in Rwanda or in Bosnia, etc., it'd be, it'd be interesting to see whether that, like, first-hand footage would actually generate some sort of, like, moral um, response. I put it, again, really cynical. I don't think it would. I think people would just become... Well, they would say that's the next picture of the other character. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Like, um, but that's... But, again, I could, I could be wrong about that, but I'm sure it's something that will be tested in the next 10, 15 years. So a group of human beings will gradually come to the collective view that we're finished. Yeah. As I sense it now. Thanks everybody for attending. Thanks especially to David for, for the presentation. I found it fascinating. And, uh, and and I knew that Kim Kardashian was Armenian. People with the names names ending I E N are commonly Armenian. So it really <laughs>